Okay. Bonnie, I think uh, you could, you're muted, but I think you can take it away. Keep myself? Okay, great. Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Bonnie johnson Ayton, and welcome to the BHS Principal Staff Community Forum. I will be serving as the moderator tonight and will be joined by one of our students, Grace Brown, who is a junior at BHS and is serving as an active member of the hiring committee. We are also joined by Paul Bisha, who is also a parent of two um, BHS, not one BHS student and one middle school student. And he too is an active member of our committee. Both Paul and Grace have been kind enough to offer to join and help me moderate and ask questions of the candidate. I do want to take a second before we get started to acknowledge and honor the diversity that exists in our community. Tonight, our district's multilingual liaisons are providing interpretation services for this event for our community, for our community members who do not speak English. Candidates, please remember to pause for a second after the question is asked so that the team can interpret, can, interpret, can translate the question before um, hearing your answers. Please join me in thanking Nora Boulay, Chacha Nuganda, and La Pardon, Parhan, liaisons for joining us, who are joining us tonight and translating. I also want to remind everyone that tonight's meeting is being streamed at the BSD YouTube channel and it is being recorded. We want to acknowledge that traditionally these types of forums are done in person, but due to COVID, as we're all fully aware of, and an abundance of caution, um, the decision was to made to do the forum virtually. Um, for those of you who are disappointed, we apologize. It would be great to have folks in front of us. I also want to remind everyone, oh, um, tonight's forum is structured so that all the candidates will, will be all asked the same questions and receive the same amount of time in which to answer those questions, um, which is three minutes per question. The mics, their mics will be muted at the end of three minutes. We'll be keeping track of that. And I think at this point, um, oh, so we, the other format um, piece is that each candidate will have the same question. And so you'll hear the question three times before we move on to the next question. A, for, a format that all the candidates are familiar with. Okay, so we have about 90 minutes. We're gonna jump right into introductions of our three candidates being considered for the position of principal at Burlington High School. Please welcome Stephen Berbeco, Greg Kirkland, and Lauren McBride. Thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me. Um, please, in answering your questions, try to be as, as specific as possible and provide concrete examples where appropriate. So I have the honor of asking the first intro question. We're gonna start with Lauren. Lauren, tell us how your professional background prepared you for this position and why you wish to be the principal of Burlington High School. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, I am incredibly honored to be uh, one of the three candidates that's here tonight um, to, to share with you um, why Burlington High School. Um, so a little bit about myself and I guess experiences that I've had that have led me to this place. Um, I have started, I started my career as a, as a teacher. So I have had that classroom experience of um, understanding um, just what it's like to, to be with kids, um, you know, working through instructional um, or just the instructional day. And then throughout my career, I have been fortunate enough to, um, to have different leadership experiences, all of which um, have somewhat led me to this place of now being um, in this position of, of, um, of being one of the candidates for the Burlington High School principal. Um, one of the most, I think, um, unique experiences prior to coming to Burlington, I um, was a, I took a position with the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. And within that role, my role was really twofold. Um, one, I was working in the um, Office of Literacy and Humanities. 
um, working on instructional pedagogy and working with teachers um, around um, high quality literacy um, um, initiatives or an instruction and what that looked like in the classroom. Um, and then uh, also as a second part of that job, I worked um, in the school district and school assistance center, helping schools to be able to do engage in school turnaround work. So I worked with principals and superintendents and teachers um, looking at their schools, thinking about what they could be doing differently um, and, and really examining um, education as a structure and, leader, and, and those leadership roles to think about how we could build capacity within the schools to be able to have them take ownership of their learning and, and, and really thinking about what's best for students um, and then being able to take on um, those structures and, and kind of leaving and having them follow the rest. That work was incredibly rewarding. Um, through that, we were able to, I was able to help um, schools build PLCs, uh, professional learning communities and uh, instructional leadership teams. Um, I was able to see really high quality instruction firsthand um, and be able to work with teachers to better improve their practice. And I feel like all of this has led me to then taking the role of assistant principal at Burlington High School where I've been over the last two years. Um, I've seen so much change for this community and so much change for this school. And I feel that we are in this place of really being ready to take on that next level of work. Um, being downtown now provides us with this opportunity to explore community-based partnerships, have our students really become entrenched within the community um, and working, um, you know, and, and being able to have hands-on experiences to, to provide more empowerment for their learning. So why me, why now, why Burlington? I love this community. I love this school. Um, I feel so fortunate to be in a place where I can now um, take what I've seen and where I've been and, and, and bring us to a new place um, where we have students that are truly empowered to take on the best of their learning. And there's my stop sign. Ooh, okay. Thanks, Lauren. Take a deep breath. And I'm going to just remind you, and as well as the other candidates, to slow down a little bit. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, next, we'll, Greg, same question. Plus, please tell us how your professional background prepared you for the, this position and why you want to be the Burlington School, Burlington High School principal. Thank you for the question and good evening Burlington community and, and thank you for being here. Um, my name is Greg Kirkland and, and I'd like to even start before uh, my professional life because my first memories were on the sideline of a football field in a classroom of the greatest educator I've ever known who was my father and so he was the role model for me and I never wanted to do anything else except for to be a, a teacher and then later on an administrator as he was. As I got into my uh, education I, I got a bachelor's degree in health and physical education and I became a teacher in health and physical education, coach football. And I did that for about 10 years before deciding to go into administration. Um, as, uh, as I got into administration, I became um, the coordinator, which we call co academic coordinator for health and physical education, but it's really most people know it as a director of curriculum for health and physical education. That was my first major role in the administration. I was in charge of 62 schools, K through 12, in Clayton County Public Schools, and, uh, and, and for the curriculum, instruction, uh, grants, everything that goes along with the department, uh, professional learning. So I, that was my first step into it. I worked doing that position for three and a half years before I was fortunate enough to get a promotion and go into the back into the schools as an assistant principal. Um, I wanted to make that that jump because I just miss being around the children. It, I love doing what I was doing and I was able to affect a lot of people, but that that relationship was not there. And relationships are extremely important to me. Um, I feel like that I can really make a difference uh, when I'm working with a little bit closer with the students. So I wanted to get back into the schools. Therefore, I've been a, an assistant principal. This is finishing my fifth year as an assistant principal. 
at a high school. And that is in a nutshell, that is my educational experience. Uh, let me back up and say one other thing before I did get into administration, I did um, act, I was a department chair for special education for six years where I was in charge of compliance, uh, the hiring and firing of teachers, uh, those types of things. So special ed uh, education has, has always been near and dear to my heart as well. And I was fortunate enough to be able to do that on the high school level for six years prior to going into administration. Thank you. And last we'll hear from Stephen. Same question, Stephen. Please tell us how your professional background prepared you for this position and why you want to be the high the principal of Burlington High School. Thanks, Bonnie. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Stephen Berbeco. Uh, I use he, him pronouns. Uh, and I want to uh, start by uh, saying Ramadan Karim and uh, to our neighbors who are celebrating Ramadan. Um, my story um, starts as a, a teacher in a school in, in Boston, uh, not that different from Burlington High School, uh, where I taught for seven years. And uh, that school valued uh, students' creativity and critical thinking. It was a wonderful place for me to get my start. And uh, frankly, it, it trained me as an educator on the foundation uh, on which I see education. Uh, and I carry that forward uh, in my professional career. Um, some years later, I worked as a superintendent on a Native American reservation in Northern Arizona. And the similarities between uh, that opportunity and being a teacher uh, are the, the inequities uh, that I saw as a teacher, as an administrator, uh, that come from historical oppression of people and systemic racism. And I did a lot of important learning for myself about my role in overcoming uh, those uh, inequities, uh, supporting students, supporting staff, and working with the community uh, to help students achieve uh, their goals and their ambitions. Um, I, uh, I, I, I wanna be a part of the success story of Burlington High School. Uh, I've been following the story for uh, a number of years, uh, and I see uh, as I, I would imagine many of you also see that downtown BHS is, uh, is a challenge, uh, but it's also a tremendous opportunity. Uh, it's an opportunity for our students, it's an opportunity for our teachers, um, and it's, a, it's an opportunity to build stronger connections to the community now that the high school is located uh, right in the middle of everything. Uh, I, I wanna be part of that. Okay, thank you. Um, before I ask you your very first question, I do have a, two reminders. One is actually just to let people know that the hiring committee is very interested in your feedback. And there is a Google form that we've developed in order for us to hear your voice. And we will review your feedback prior to making a recommendation to the superintendent for our finalists. This form is available on the Burlington School District website um, on the DHS principal search page. And we are also going to paste that um, link into the chat um, for your convenience. And lastly, um, I want to remind you that we do have interpreters and just to take a deep breath before you answer the question so they can interpret and then breathe while you're answering. I know it's, this is always a little nerve wracking and three minutes sometimes feels like it goes pretty quickly. All right, so then moving on, the next question goes to Greg. Greg, could you tell us in your view, what does educational equity look like as a leader and how does it fit into your educational philosophy when applied to teachers? Equity, in my opinion, in the field of education and relating to teachers uh, and students is we just need to make sure that everybody is on the same playing field. I, I always think of the, the uh, fence 
the, the poster of the fence when you talk about equity where the children are looking over the fence and they're trying to watch the basketball game and the, or the baseball game and they're at various sizes. One may have a bo- have one box, the other has two boxes, another has three boxes, but they all look the same or they're all at the same level and they all have that same view. So in education, that's what we need to do. We need to level the playing field for all of our students and make sure that they all have what they need. Now, in terms of the teachers, how do we get the teachers to ensure that happens in the classroom? I look at things like scaffolding their their lessons. I look at differentiation. I look at the various resources that they're using. Uh, For our EL students, we'll need to have um, some of our materials translated to their native language. Um, these types of things, anything that we can do to, f- to get them uh, to the same part where they are so they can all learn equally. But the first thing you have to be able to do in order to, to know that is to know your students. And so you know, need to know who your students are and what their individual needs are. One thing that I used to do as a teacher was I gave a learning style test to everybody the first day to see what types of learners were, were in my classroom. Were they kinesthetic learner? Were they a visual learner? What type of learner were they? And so that was my first step in my differentiation process with my students. So we need to make sure that our teachers are properly trained and prepared in order to do that. Additionally, teachers need to be able to understand how to uh, review data, disaggregate data, to find out where students currently are in their academic levels. And once they know where they are academically and where they are uh, with with all other aspects that we need to look at, then the teachers know where they need to start. That's their starting point. And then you go into your differentiation. Now, I always tell my teachers, you can make your groups however you want to, but you should be able to explain to me why these five students are in a group. Are they a mixed, um, are they a mixed a group that they're mixed as far as what they can do, mixed abilities? Uh, or are they same abilities as a heterogeneous, homogeneous? What type of groups are you putting them in and what data did you use to put them in those groups? So I always ask my teachers to make sure they put that on their lesson plan. So when I look into the classrooms, then I see that uh, how they got into the groups. So that's how I see it in the, in the classroom. With my educational philosophy, how it rea- how it jives uh, Greg, I believe you muted yourself. No, I think I think his three minutes was up. Uh, I will be quiet. <laughs> no worries. All right. And again, I know it's difficult. But just a reminder in terms of as you're speaking, it is helpful to have you chunk your answers and pause again for um, translation purposes. Does that make sense? Okay. By the end of this, we'll have it down. No worries. Okay. The next, um, Stephen, same question. Can you tell us in your view, what does educational equity look like as a leader? And how does it fit into your educational philosophy when applied to teachers? Uh, thanks, Bonnie. Um, first, which languages uh, is this being translated into? Yeah, good question. Stephanie, do you know? Um... I do not know. Okay. <laughs> I, uh, I, I'm happy to answer the, the question about equity. Uh, so, uh, ed- educational equity, I for me is making sure that the students, staff, teachers have the resources that they need for them uh, when they need them. Uh, and uh, public education has historically done uh, a terrible job of this. Uh, I agree with with Greg that um, we have a, a responsibility to make sure that uh, the, the, everyone has the fence of the ball game uh, when they wanna watch the game. Uh, and it's a responsibility of public education to make sure that 
everyone has the box that's right for them. Now that, that's the bad news. The good news is that in, in one part of public education, we're doing that really well. Uh, and that is supporting uh, students who are served by uh, special education departments. Uh, those students have individualized education plans, which basically say what resources those students need in order to have equity. Uh, and I would love to take that model and expand it in a way across a high school so that all of our students have the resources that they need when they need them that are right for them. Uh, teachers also need resources. And that's where this difference between instructional leadership on the one hand and operational leadership on the other hand comes in. Operational leadership is a responsibility of a principal and that's the day-to-day -day operations. Make sure that the students and staff have the physical space, the nutritious meals, the transportation that they need in order to learn. Instructional leadership is making sure that the teachers have the support and the systemic support to be the exceptional teachers that they are. Uh, I feel that as a principal, uh, I have a responsibility to provide both the operational leadership and the instructional leadership to ensure equity for students uh, and for teachers. Okay, thank you. Lauren, can you tell us in your view, what does educational equity look like as a leader and how does it fit into your educational philosophy when applied to teachers? So when I think about educational equity and what this looks like, I think about this in a few different buckets. I think about it in terms of access, in terms of being seen, heard, and valued, and also in terms of having the space in order to implement and make change. Uh, and so when I, if I start with just being seen, heard, and valued, I think one of the things that as an educational leader um, and working within a school that we have to really do is, is understand and take the time and space to know our, our students, our community, um, where they come from, um, what their experiences are and what they value. And that comes from listening. It comes from building relationships. It comes from welcoming our community in um, to the school and to be part of that of, and to be part of our conversation. Um, currently, right now, I, um, we have started to meet with a, a family advisory committee, um, and that family advisory committee represents different families from within our community that come and serve as a think tank within our school. Um, and it's been amazing to hear, again, just some of the, the things that they value, um, that our families value, and that they, they identify as important within education. Um, when I think about access, I think about access um, not only to, um, to, I think about access, access to instruction and education and content. So it's not only um, differentiation and accommodations within lesson structures, it's also making sure again, that our students and our families and their, um, their experiences are seen within curriculum, that um, any sort of content is tangible and has real life applications that, that, is, that people can connect to. Um, and that adds an entry point in terms of access to allow all of our students to be able to think critically um, and, and engage in content in a deeper, more meaningful way, um, specifically as it relates back to the community in which we live. Um, I also think about access in terms of resources, as Stephen um, you know, mentioned as well, um, and ensuring that not only our faculty and staff, but our students have the resources that they need and we have the resources that we need to provide really meaningful educational opportunities for our students. Um, I also think about just, uh, you know, again, that space to make change and the importance of being able to engage in important um, and, and cour courageous conversations. Um, just this week with our lead teacher group, we um, started to just calibrate what our definition of equity and inclusion 
um, and diversity means because these terms are very big and broad. And if we don't come together for a collective understanding, we're never gonna be able to make the change that we need um, in a way that's meaningful for our students and for our families. And so again, I think in terms of educational equity, it's about access, it's about being seen, heard, and valued through relationships, and it's providing that space to be able to implement change. Thank you. Okay. All right, next question, we're gonna start with Stephen. BHS has experienced trauma as a learning community in the, past, in the recent past. What steps would you take to rebuild a culture of inclusion and trust? And how would you foster a community of accountability and high expectations? Thank you, Bonnie. Um, it, it's, it's clear that um, Burlington High School has endured uh, trauma recently uh, with uh, the pandemic, uh, with the change in leadership, with the change in physical location and the uncertainty around that. Uh, and, and there's a lot there that easily de derail uh, the staff, the faculty, the students from the important work ahead. Uh, and that's where trauma-informed leadership comes in. Uh, Trauma-informed leadership uh, uses established best practices based on empirical research to help support a community through trauma to continue to work with each other, to learn to trust each other again, and to ensure inclusion instead of exclusion. Trauma-informed leadership includes things like uh, transparency and communication, making sure that everyone has the same information at the same time, and making sure that voices are heard. Uh, I consider myself a, a servant leader, and that's an approach that I've taken in many organizations in my professional career. And servant leadership for me is anticipating the needs of the people around me and removing obstacles uh, in the best case before they even know that they're there. Servant leadership for me is active listening and thoughtful communication. Uh, not just with the people directly around me, but with a large school community. And I've done that before as a superintendent, reaching out to the school community through a newspaper, uh, through uh, radio, through community engagement meetings, making sure that everyone has my cell phone number so that if there are any questions about what the information is, they can hear it from me directly anytime they want. It also means making sure that students know that if they want to come talk with me, they're the most important people. That no matter who I'm talking to, there's no one more important than a student. And I'll interrupt that conversation to make sure that a student is heard. Okay, thank you. Lauren, BHS has experienced as a learning community, I'm sorry, BHS as a learning community has experienced trauma in recent past. What steps would you take to rebuild a culture of inclusion and trust? And how would you foster a community of accountability and high expectations? So I think one of the first and, and one of the things that I lead with um, as a leader is, is the value of building relationships and making space to, to know people um, and, and be relationship driven. Um, I think it's really important to get to know our faculty and staff, um, hear the stories of, of where they've been, um, just the what has happened in the past here at BHS with 
the, you know, the kind of constant change of leadership over the past five years, um, some of the, the trauma of losing our building through PCBs, um, our, the most recent leadership change, COVID being, you know, being, uh, being sent to be remote. And so I think it's listening and, and allowing people space um, to be able to talk about their experience and know that their experience is real um, and, and, and matters. Um, and I feel like just by starting through getting to know people um, through their experience, but also getting to know them as people who their families are, things that they like to do on the weekends, um, those things are really important as well to get to understand just our faculty and staff. Um, we have been talking a lot um, about um, moving to a healing centered approach um, and a healing centered approach is coming as being able to acknowledge that trauma has happened and then making the steps towards healing um, and that healing is really important because it provides us not of being in this deficit, but being able to step out of that and mo make movement forward. Um, and so what does that look like? Um, here, what some of the things that, um, that I've talked to our, our staff about is providing space. Um, some of that looks like restorative circles where we've provided opportunities for staff to come and sit in circle on different topics if they choose to be able to, to talk about um, some of the lived experiences that they've had and share those with others. Um, it also just comes from having an open door policy of, of, of teachers and faculty and staff just stopping by to, to say hello, or maybe if you see them, just also saying, you know, how are you? I, I noticed this is, or I noticed that you seemed a little off today. Are you okay? And just making sure that they feel seen. Um, in terms of like, as you get to know people, I think then that's how we can move into setting high expectations and being account and setting um, high expectations for accountability. Um, one of the things that I pride myself on is modeling um, hard work and ethic and work ethic. Um, I truly believe that in order to be part of the change, I have to be part of the work. Um, and so I definitely am, um, I lead with boots on the ground and being part of that conversation and not stepping away from it, but wanting to get dirty and, and have these conversations as well um, and getting in the weeds of that. Um, I also feel like um, it's, it's making sure that people know that all conversations are student-centered and decisions that are being made are centered around students and that hard conversations may happen where we may disagree at the end, but we're leaving with the understanding that we're doing what's best for students. And so with that, um, try to maintain that piece. <laughs> Thank you, Lauren. All right, Greg, this question's for you. BHS has experienced trauma as a learning community in the recent past. What steps would you take to rebuild a culture of inclusion and trust? How would you foster a community of accountability and high expectations? That's a very good question. And there are a lot of things that need to go into the answer with this. Fortunately enough, my colleagues, Stephen and Lauren, have done a great job with explaining what needs to be done. So I want to talk about how that actually looks. OK, so Stephen talked a lot about the, the scientific piece and Lauren talked about the relationships and both of those are extremely important. Uh, but how does that look in an everyday day to day setting with these with these students? And that's by talking to them, by getting to know them, understanding what they need understanding what they've gone through. I understand that Burlington is, is a little bit different. Burlington High School is a little bit different in terms of the trauma that, has, that they've experienced recently. However, there are a lot of other traumas that, that students are going through that, that I see every day that we also have to take into account. So it's not even so much the obvious uh, traumas that we know about, the more damaging traumas are the traumas that we do not know about. And so that's where establishing relationships with students, with teachers, building the trust with them is important. How do you build trust? You build trust by, I say what I say, I say what, I, what I'm going to do and I do what I say. And so if, if you do that, and if I tell you I'm going to do something and I do it, do it then that's going to start building trust with me. So that's very important that you're honest, that you keep your word as to what, what you're talking about in this situation. So it, it reminds me of uh, um, a Facebook uh, live event that I saw the other day. It was from the 100 Black Men of Atlanta. And this was on just a couple of days ago. And the gentleman said, I'm going to quote, he said, 
you should not define success by the absence of failure. So Michael, J Michael Jordan was cut from his JV basketball team. And, and look where he's at now. I'm getting the countdown now, so I'm going to shorten this up. And so we see failures. Failures is part of the process. Trauma is part of the process. We need to understand it. We need to recognize it. We need to build the trust with the students so we know what they're going through and how we need to address it. Okay, thank you. All right, I'm going to turn the questioning over to Paul. Paul? Hi, hi everybody. So uh, this next question is gonna go to Lauren first. Uh, BHS is now downtown BHS after a difficult year. This move offers both opportunities and challenges. So the question is, what are the opportunities and what challenges do you anticipate at the start of the school year, in three years, and in five years? So some of the challenge or some of the let's let's start with um, all the opportunities that we have here. Um, I think a lot of the opportunities that, that we have with being at downtown BHS is that we are now so much closer to um, our community partners um, in different parts of, of our city that allows a lot of um, that allows for more interaction with our for our classes to be able to engage with different community partnerships and project based learning opportunities that we didn't have before. It's not that we're that far away, but now just accessibility wise, we can step out of our front door and be at Echo in less than you know than less than five minutes, or be up the street on Church Street in you know again under two minutes. So I think accessibility and the ability to work with community partners that are really eager to help to support our school um, provides a lot of or a lot of um, opportunities for our students and for our faculty and staff. Um, I also think that that comes with some challenges as well because working and, and thinking about how to take curriculum that we have and transfer some of that to really being more than just field trip driven, but really being community project based and being able to provide authentic experiences within the curriculum um, will be, you know, will be some work that that we're all engaging with um, as a community and some of the work that we have planned um, for our, our faculty and staff and leading them through um, some professional development to help them make those changes. Some of our teachers are, are already doing it and and um, and and we can see it in some of the curriculum and the classes that they're coming out with. And I think that we this provides an opportunity for us to really even do more with that. Um, and I see that as we, you know, as we continue next year and, and three years and five years that those partnerships and that learning and those experiences continue to grow and cultivate and change as we, as we learn more and become better with this. Um, as we start the next school year, um, just one of the challenges that I do see um, that we still have is, is coming back in person after being remote for, for over a year. Um, you know, we're still in a hybrid model. And so we're now thinking about ways that we can come back into a brand new space um, with all of our students next year. And I think we have to really be thoughtful about how we're entering into this space again, leading again with, um, with understanding and, and time to be able to um, have that space to get to know each other again and, and navigate um, at halls of 900 and, you know, over almost a, just under a thousand students. Um, and thinking about how those classes now look as we're welcoming more students back at the same time. So I see it really as a lot of opportunities and places for growth and the next five years to really be a time where we can look, refine, and continue to, to make these, um, to change our curriculum and have it grow um, to be really meaningful and to be a meaningful partner within the community. Thank you. Stephen, uh, same question. BHS is now downtown BHS after a difficult year. This move offers both opportunities and challenges. What are the opportunities and what challenges do you anticipate at the start of the school year in three years and in five years? Thanks, Paul. I, uh, yeah, I'm gonna have to agree with Lauren on a lot of the things that she said that, that both the opportunities and the challenges come down to uh, community. Uh, that downtown PHS has an extraordinary opportunity in building a larger, strong school community 
through internships, through project-based learning, through making changes to the curriculum uh, so that the experience of students is embedded in being in an urban space. Uh, it's something that downtown BHS can really grab onto, uh, take advantage of, uh, and, um, and make into a, a, a positive uh, experience for its community. At the same time, uh, that community is coming back from uh, being remote, being uh, having uh, challenges, uh, personal challenges and societal challenges. And it's gonna be difficult to, to build the community back up again, to build that sense of inclusion, that sense of trust, uh, some things that I've seen already are really exciting to me, uh, that the, the teachers are already taking steps to, to build that trust back. Uh, I, I'm thinking of Billy Ray's uh, music video to welcome students back that was uh, a takeoff on Hamilton. I'm thinking of uh, Brennan uh, poking fun at himself and talking about how he's going to go bankrupt if they have to move into a department store as a school. Uh, that sort of approach um, helps to rebuild the trust that was already there. And students can learn better in that sort of environment. I see the most immediate concerns are operational, making sure that the space is uh, ready for the learning that's going to happen. Uh, I anticipate there will be some bumps uh, that we'll work through together. Looking three years down the line, uh, well, that's the timeline for moving back to the old building. Uh, and um, according to the most recent reports from the superintendent, uh, it sounds like that might be a heavier lift than anticipated. And then five years down the line, gosh, I don't even know whether downtown BHS will still be downtown BHS because of the PCB issues, uh, or if there will be another approach, another solution that we'll come to together as a school community. Thank you. Greg, BHS is now downtown BHS after a difficult year. The move offers both opportunities and challenges. What are the opportunities and what challenges do you anticipate at the start of the school year in three years and in five years. I've always been told that when you when life gives you lemon, you make lemonades. And there are a lot of positive things that, that are coming out of a situation like being in downtown uh, Burlington High School. And some of those Lauren touched upon, there, there are a lot of things that teachers can do with, with project-based learning with their students. Today, we need to, think outside the box and to touch some students because traditional teaching doesn't reach all students. It goes back to my original, uh, one of the other comments I was making about knowing who your students are and what they need. And so you have to think outside the box to make things interesting. Um, so there's the project-based learning that's, that's possible. Also, I saw, the, I saw a meeting yesterday, the other day with the city council and Burlington uh, School Board and Superintendent Flanagan where they were discussing the building. And there already is a great partnership with the community. It's very obvious. So, but with them being right there in downtown, you can make that even stronger, more str stronger relationships with the, with the uh, businesses, work-based learning, students leaving school half time to, to get credit by working um, out in a job. Those are all some real positive things that come out of something like this. Some of the, one of the, the biggest challenge that I see, not only just in one year, but in three years, when you're in a non-traditional building, such as uh, an old Macy's, Macy's building, the first thing that I'm concerned about is safety and security of my students. I always wanna make sure that when I send your son home to you, he's in better shape than when you sent him to me that day. And I don't want anything to happen to my students. So the security and the sa the security of the school and the safety of my students is of utmost importance, importance to me. So as an as a leader of the building, 
And uh, I'm concerned about that. And that to me would be the greatest challenge in, in one year and three years. Now, in five years, I don't have any concerns in terms of challenges with the building. As I said, I saw the meeting the other day that happened between the, the city and, and, and the school board. And I have utmost confidence that the leaders in the city and the leaders in the school district will make the appropriate decisions and have a, a outstanding new facility for our students to be in in five years. So in five years, I expect for us to all be doing very well and, and all of this being taken care of and, and, a, and a thing of, a, of the past. Okay, uh, next question. I will start with Steven. I, ha I have this question too. In what ways will you engage all stakeholders in the education of BHS students? I'm sorry, Paul, you, you cut off at the end. Would you mind repeating that? Sure. In what ways will you engage all stakeholders in the education of BHS students? I, uh, I, I can tell you what I've done so far. Uh, um, when, when I saw the, that this opportunity was posted, uh, before I, I sent in an application, uh, I, I went and got in touch with uh, parents of BHS students. Uh, I, I got in touch with current students. Um, I talked with teachers, uh, with staff from the high school and also staff from central office. Uh, and, and I talked to a former board member. Uh, and I, I wanted to know from them what they wanted to see from the high school. Just um, what, what, what do you imagine the next principal would be like? Uh, and how would you know that person is doing a good job? And, and I, heard, I heard a couple of themes. Uh, I heard uh, transparency, uh, that stakeholders want to know what's going on. Uh, and, and they want access. They want to be able to talk with the principal uh, and have clear, open, consistent uh, communication. And, and I also heard high expectations for students and also for staff. Uh, and I, I heard that loud and clear as well. Uh, I have experience uh, supporting a staff uh, using uh, methods of transparency uh, and access uh, to make sure that the entire school community uh, hears the same thing. Uh, and also that I get continuous feedback from stakeholders about how things are going. And so that if there's a problem as a school leader, I know about it right away. And I've also had experience setting high expectations for students uh, as a teacher in an urban school uh, and as a superintendent where together in our school community, we raised the graduation rate uh, from about 50% to about 75% over the course of two years. Did you see that? <laughs> and as one of the hazards of uh, having an interview on Zoom, uh, that it's pretty much guaranteed that a small child or animal will come in and say hello at some point. Uh, and so Paul, uh, th that's how I engage. Uh, I, I don't wait until day one. Uh, I don't wait until um, I'm selected, uh, if that's what happens. Uh, I start uh, right away, uh, as soon as I know the opportunity is there, uh, because that, that's how the connections are made. Uh, and that's, that's how I support my learning. Thank you. Uh, Greg, we'll have you go next. In what ways will you engage all stakeholders in the education of BHS students? This is a great question. And I would start out with communication. You have to have open, clear communication with all stakeholders of the school. So when we talk about stakeholders, 
we're talking about students, we're talking about parents, faculty, staff, community members, board members, everybody that has any type of stake in the school. And we have to have open, clear communication with them. We want to put everything on our websites, all of our academic events that are going on, all of the athletic events. We want everything to be on websites so that everybody can see what's going on in the school. We want to make sure that we are uh, putting the positive out there that when something positive happens that you know about it even if your child isn't on the debate team or, or is not an honor society you still hear about us winning a state championship or a national championship and whatever it is that we're doing so we want to make sure that we communicate with that any issues that happen in the school that maybe are negative that we have to get out to people so we curtail any rumors that may be happening. We need to get that out there. That kind of goes back to the transparency of what Stephen was talking about earlier, which takes me into the very next point, which is the open door policy. I believe that you should have an open door policy when you're running a school. I want you as a parent, if you want to come in and see if your child is doing what your child is doing, by all means, show up anytime you want. I will walk you to that classroom yourself and we can look in the door, not interrupt instruction, but look in the door and see that the child is in there doing what they're supposed to be doing. It takes a community to raise a child, as we've heard. And so we need the parents help, we need the parent support, and we need to be transparent with the parents and, and, and have an open door policy. I am not the type of person where if you wanna meet with me, you have to have an appointment. If I'm at the school and you walk in the school, I'm gonna meet with you. It's that you're just as important as anybody else. And, and, and so that's very important that we do that. The other thing is that adding to the community relationships of what's already there. I, I said before that I see that the Burlington community seems to be a very tight knit community, which is something that I really like, which is really attractive to me. Uh, I didn't talk about that in the first question of why I wanted to be principal there, but that's, that's one of the reasons because it's such a tight knit community. And so I want to add to those community relationships and, and, and improve upon that because we can always improve with communication and relationships within the community. Okay, thank you. Lauren, in what ways will you engage all stakeholders in the education of BHS students? So some of the things that um, I've been able to do in the short time since I um, became interim principal here at BHS um, was to, to launch a family and student advisory panels. Um, again, I think that this was a first way um, that we could begin to bring student and, and, and um, parent and guardian voice into our community. Um, I, I think that I, I, I echo what um, Greg and Stephen have, have said in the past around open door policies and inviting community in. And I think that that has been a missing piece that we that we had that we faced at BHS over the last couple of years um, has not been to, you know, have our doors as widely open and available um, for our community. Um, whether it's parents and guardians or just even community partners to be able to come in um, and, and wanna work with us um, to help to support our students um, through their process. So um, I value just the, the work that our family and student, student advisories have started to do just in the quick short time that we've been able to launch them. We, uh, together we meet um, as with my um, leadership team um, and we, we talk about just things that matter to them. Um, what is some of the change that they want to see um, happen here as at, at BHS? What are some of their hopes and dreams and ways that we can continue to build our community together? Um, so, so I see them as critical partners um, in this work, um, as well as all of our families. Um, we have, um, you know, again, we're, we're welcoming our families in. We have parent volunteers that were incredibly um, helpful and supportive as we moved into downtown BHS and being able to have them here in the building um, and, and just talk to them about their experience and hear what matters to them has been helpful as we've been able to make movement forward. Um, I also just think like walking through the hallways and stopping in on student classrooms and seeing them in action, um, going up to a student, you know, as they're working on a math problem with a with a, a peer and saying like, what are you doing? 
why does this matter? Can you, you know, tell me about it? And having those just like kind of spur of the moment conversations, as well as when you see them walking through the hallways to stop and say like, how was your weekend? Like what's going on? Um, provides provides us with um, a, a place to begin to, to build a, a relationship where they feel that they're valued, heard, uh, valued and heard. Um, I also just think being visible, like being visible within the community, whether it's at um, community events like athletic events, whether it's at um, a musical or a theater production that we have, um, provides us with the opportunity to just meet and, and see people informally and be able to hear again things that are going on um, in their life and maybe making some of those connections um, and being able to think about how what we hear impacts the greater school community. Um, also, I think it's it's taking phone calls from the community. Um, I've been uh, we've had some outreach from community partners and being able to take the time and space to say hello. It's nice to hear from you and hear their idea provides us with a context of where we can go and what we can bring into the school. All right. Hey, thank you. I'll be taking over the questioning. And my first question is for Greg. What is your approach to working with leaders or with teachers as educators, as colleagues, and as people? Thank you for that question. And it's good to see you on this panel. I'm glad to see a student on here. So thank you. Um, so do me a favor, just read through that one more time. There's a couple pieces that I missed and I wanna make sure I'm understanding it. Yeah, of course. What is your approach to working with teachers as educators, as colleagues, and as people? As people it is the biggest part to me because yes, we're all educators, we're all teachers, we're all administrators, but we're all people and we all have feelings. And so we talk about trauma-informed classrooms. We talk about circle of support. We talk about restorative practices for students, but teachers need that as well. Teachers are going through some issues as well through COVID and through other things. So I, I approach them as people and I treat them as people, number one. Number two, I treat them as the professionals that they are. I said that in, in my biography that I sent in, and I mean it 100%. You have to treat teachers as professionals. They are in a professional job, just like all the rest of us are. And so we have to make sure, we have to be sure that we treat them as professionals. I've seen, in my experience as a teacher and, and, and even as an administrator, I haven't treated people that way, but I've seen teachers be treated so poorly, particularly first year, second year, the third year, the induction time uh, of teachers where they've been treated so poorly and we've lost them as educators and they go into another, into another job. And that's really difficult. And, and, and it's really a shame that that's happening. Sometimes we see, we see people who are in the job for the wrong reasons and my sole reason to be in this job is for you, Grace. And I want to be here for you. I want to make sure that you get everything that you need and you're able to treat, achieve every dream that you can achieve. And there are any obstacles in the way. And I'm your principal. I'm going to do everything that I can to remove those obstacles. And I need my teachers doing the same thing. I'm going to treat you like you're my child. I want my teachers to treat you like you're there. You are their child. And so it starts by treating the teachers with respect and treating them the way that they want to be treated. And, and then it trickles all the way down. And that's where you start really building the culture and the climate of the school. So the way teachers are treated to me is second only to the way students are treated. But it's very, it's extremely important that we treat teachers the way they need to be treated. Thank you. Lauren, what is your approach to working with teachers? as educators, as colleagues, and as people. Thank you, Grace. Um, so I, I definitely echo um, what Greg had, had mentioned. Um, I lead with relationships. I think it is really important to get to know um, our faculty and staff um, and, and 
understand things that they value, understand and get to learn a little bit about them and their family. Um, and then also just their expertise and their and what they what they care about and um, within the classroom as well. Um, I also think it's important to get to understand like just what it is that they want to do and how they want to grow professionally. And um, I see my role as a leader is to be to be able to provide them with the con um, is to really to be able to support and provide the conditions to which they can do their best work. Um, and so I think that that comes in a number of different ways. I think it comes with providing them with opportunities for professional development, um, opportunities for to lean in on them and value and see them as experts um, and different things and see how we can utilize on their expertise within our own professional learning within the building. Um, I think it also comes with, um, with Ask, with, with goal setting and sitting down and talking to them. What is it? Is there something that you want to improve upon that you feel that you have that would be a challenge that you want that you want to help to get to your next level or get to that next place within your teaching career? Um, and so I, I think it's making sure that we we see not only that we see them as people, but then we really um, look to them to value what they bring, um, the expertise and the lens that they come in with every day to also see what they, how they can also add to our community and not, you know, beyond just the walls of a classroom. Um, and so as a leader, I, I feel like it's my, my, my job to, to really provide those conditions for them to be able to do their best work and to see what's possible within their career. Um, and so I feel like I, I'm kind of a connector of, of different pieces, um, a connector of, of, being able to see opportunities and, and making sure that I reach out to, to different faculty and staff to say, have you seen this? Um, this could be something that, you know, really, it made me think of you when I saw this. Um, and also to provide them with the with the creativity and the or with the flexibility to be able to dream big and take those steps within their career to maybe explore something different. Um, so in terms of um, just working with educators, I think it's making sure that we, what I would like to do is make sure that I listen, um, that I get to know them, that we work uh, again beside each other um, and make decisions that are within the best interest, again, for, for our students um, and what they need within, within the classroom and being able to, to um, collegially and professionally um, push our, our educators to be the best that they can be within our school community and providing them with the opportunities to do that. Thank you. Stephen, what is your approach to working with teachers as educators, as colleagues, and as people? Thanks, Grace. Uh, you know, if you look across the country at the uh, best schools, uh, the ones that um, really support their students uh, to, to reach their dreams. Um, one thing that they have in common uh, isn't actually how much money they have. Uh, one thing they have in common is, is the relationships within those schools. And that's the relationships uh, among the teachers and teachers and administration, definitely the relationship with the students and the relationship among the students. Uh, and it's that strong sense of community that propels a whole school forward, that brings everyone up to that next level. And uh, for me, th that's a lot of what servant leadership is. It's learning about the people around me, uh, as Lauren said, and, and leaning into their strengths. And that, that's not just teachers. That's not just staff, that's, that's also students. And so when an opportunity comes available, making sure that, that everyone knows about it and that everyone has the opportunity to, to grow in the way that they want to grow, where they have strengths uh, or where they're not yet strong, but that's where they wanna work. That for me, that's what servant leadership is. And, and that describes a lot of my, the way I work with, with teachers. Let, let me give you an example. Uh, when I was a superintendent in, at Hopi Junior Senior High School, uh, there was a, a math teacher who was extraordinary at what she did because of the relationships 
that she had built with her colleagues and especially her students. And, and that teacher uh, wanted to grow further. And so as a school leader, I made sure that she could connect to indigenous math circles, which is a culturally relevant approach to doing math that makes more sense for students, that makes more sense for teachers, that helped her to grow professionally and helped her students grow academically and reach their goals in math. So that, that's an example of making sure that everyone has the resources that they need and making sure that as a school community, we have mutual trust, inclusion, uh, and support for each other. Thank you. Moving on to the next question, and I'll start with Lauren. What does student-centered education look like to you, and how would you make sure that it happens at BHF? Please give us an example. So student-centered education, um, to me, I, I think, you know, is, is primarily in the name. It's making sure that our students are, um, are, are seen, valued, um, and heard within the experiences that we have in the classroom. Um, and so what does that mean? What does that look like? Um, I think it, it's, it, it, what it means, like, is truly leading with the, stu with the students first. Um, and so decisions that are made, I think like not only within curriculum, um, but also policies, structures, all start and start and start and end with our students. And so what that looks like is as decisions are made, making sure that we're including the student lens. Um, and that comes in a variety of different ways. It comes with making sure that as, as we're dreaming big, that we're saying, well, what would this experience look like for a student? Um, and making sure that we have those conversations where students are at the forefront um, of, of different policies and decisions um, as we move forward um, within, within the school system. Um, it's also making sure that we receive student feedback on different s systems and structures. You know, what do you think of this? Um, you know, are there areas that we could do things differently? It's including students in on some of those instructional leadership meetings um, uh, or lead teacher meetings to have, make sure that their voice is also heard as we're thinking of our larger global community. Um, what, is, what it also looks like is student voice and empowerment. Um, what I would love to see here at BHS is being able to grow our students to really take on um, ownership and being visible within the hallways. It could look like having students um, help to support our student support team in the hub where students may act as peers um, or you know, we do have some students that are already acting in that peer mentor role, but wouldn't it be great to have a place where it's visible and seen within the wall or within the construct of our downtown BHS school? Um, and so I think it's so student centered education. It's also making sure that our curriculum um, reflects, again, the values, the experiences, the cultures um, of our of our students and their families. Um, and so I feel like it lives in a lot of different ways, but it's making sure that no matter what we do, we're, we're going back to the student level to make sure that it's accessible for students, that it's that it's relevant for students. Um, and that it's meaningful for students. And, and I just see us as having such an opportunity here at Downtown BHS to be able to bring students in in a more meaningful way and have them take control of this community and, and be these and be active participants um, within the hallways and within the, that's just the construct of our school. Um, and so, you know, again, I think like an example, because um, I know Grace had asked for that, but I just, um, I think an example would be that's, I go back to student support, having our students be members of our student support team and be peer mentors for students um, here at BHS. Thank you. Uh, Steven, what is your approach to working with teachers? As educators, as colleagues, sorry, wrong question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I believe this question is for Greg. What does student-centered education look like to you and how would you make sure that it happens at BHS? Please give us an example. Uh, 
Okay, so I love this question as well. As a health and PE coordinator, I was in charge of writing curriculum for professional development for my teachers in Clayton County Public Schools. We have over 52,000 students, and so lots and lots of teachers as well. So what we did is we brought in what's called explicit instruction or the gradual release model. And, and that starts out where it's teacher-centered, and then it moves to student-centered. So where it, what it looks like is I do, we do, you do. So as a teacher and a health and PRP teacher is a great example of how to do this, but I'm going to model how to, how to kick a football for you. And then you're going to get with a partner and then they're going to do the same thing. And then you do it by yourself. And it's the same thing when you're working in the, in the academic setting, it may look like, um, you're, you're doing, working on DBQs and social studies and, and, and you're going through the document and the teacher is going through the document with you and, and, and showing you the, the important critical pieces in the document that needs to be read and, and do a deep dive. And then they do that with their friend or a partner and then they do it by themselves. So it's a gradual release model and student centered. You see what, this, what the teachers need, I mean, what the students need and you provide that. Um, the students will choose what they want to learn, can choose what they want to learn within the confines of the lesson that's being taught. So it gives the students a little bit of choice, and that actually gives the student a little bit of buy-in, and it's a little, a, it makes it kind of fun. It makes learning a lot more fun for the student. The, but the other piece to it is that you have to, to talk about is what is the, what are the assessments look like? when you're talking about student-based learning or student-centered learning. And so with the assessments, you're always, you sure, you're always gonna have a formative end of grade assessment or end of unit assessment. That's always gonna be there. But for student-centered, you're gonna be looking at shorter assessments, the, the, the formative assessments. Every day, you should be doing four or five, six formative assessments in the classroom. If it's a quick, are you guys with me, thumbs up or thumbs down, you, you could do a quick assessment. Is, is everybody with you? Does everybody understand? So that's in a nutshell how, how it will look in the classroom and, and on the campus at, at Burlington High School. Thank you. Um, Stephen, what does student-centered education look like to you, and how would you make sure that it happens at DHS? Please give us an example. Well, Grace, I think that there's an important difference between student voice and student-centered ed education, uh, and bo both of those uh, are, are priorities for me. A student voice is, for instance, uh, as superintendent, I made sure that for the first time ever, there was a student representative to the board uh, to make sure that student voice was carried directly to the highest level of leadership. Uh, as superintendent, I, I met monthly with the student government to make sure that I knew what was on their minds uh, and I could answer any questions they have directly. And that's, that's student voice. Uh, Student-centered education, uh, for me, it, it comes back to this basic idea of high school as a place of self-discovery for students and also self-expression. And a high school that, that is doing a really good job for its students gives them opportunities for self-discovery that meets their needs uh, and also provides opportunities for self-expression. Uh, at, at Hopi Junior Senior High School, uh, we did this by inviting students to build out art projects uh, that would hang on walls uh, or be physical objects like benches uh, that had designs important to the local community and include that in the school environment as a way of supporting the students' self-discovery of what was important to them and self-expression and celebration, that it's something that's important to us as a school community, we wanna display it. We all wanna see it. We all wanna celebrate it together. 
Thank you. I have one last question for you three, and I'll start with Greg. If you earn this position, how will you measure your success in five years? What will it mean to graduate from BHS? In order to graduate from BHS, it's going to mean that you are globally competitive. That means no matter where you wind up, whether you go to Harvard, whether you go to the military, whether you get into a, a company and you move to another country, wherever you go, you're going to be globally competitive. Your scores on the ACTs and the SATs and the PISAs, they're all going to be competitive with everybody else's. So as far as the academic side, that's what we look at. That's what the end goal is when, when, when I have for my goals for my students. The other thing is, of course, we want to, in order to get there, we're going to look at increments of improvement in terms of our, our, our math scores, our ELA scores, our science scores, all the assessments that we have to take. We're looking for a 10%, at least 10 to 15% increase every year in those assessments, because it's not going to happen overnight. We're not going to go get, get globally competitive and three days and six months or one year. It's going to take over a little bit of time, but we will get there. So that's the academic side. But the, the way that I really judge it is through the relationships with the students, with the parents, with the communities. And so I, I, my students, when they leave school, they come back and they tell me how much they're going to miss me, how much they're going to miss the school, how loved they felt, how safe they felt. And sometimes they, it, it kind of works a little bit to the other side because sometimes they don't really quite want to leave yet, you know? And, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, but sometimes you got to give them a hug or pat them on the shoulder and say, you're an adult now, it's time to do this. You know, you're ready. And as, as we say in the South, the hay's in the barn, you know, we've done all the work we need to do. Now let's just go out and prove what you've done and make yourself and make your parents and make your educators proud of you and go out to the world and change the world because that's what we want you guys to do. We want y'all to go out there and change the world and say, yes, I went to Burlington High School and yes, I had an outstanding principal that made sure he would not accept my anything that was except for my very, very best, because I don't accept anything besides the best from you. And so it, as long as that's in place, then we're successful. Now, as I as I alluded to a few minutes ago, when I listened to this broadcast from 100 Black Men, it doesn't mean that you don't see failures. Uh, 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 success does not mean absence of failures. We're going to see some failures along the way, but those are growing processes, not only for you, but for us as well. So we're all growing together. We're all growing together. And so that's what it's going to look like. And, and, and in short, family. Thank you. Stephen, if you earn this position, how will you measure your success in five years? What will it mean to graduate from BHS? Gosh, you know, um, I'm going to put it out there uh, that it, it, it doesn't matter to me as much how I would measure my success as how the school community would measure my success. And the conversations that I've started so far, um, they suggest to me uh, basically three things that the school community wants from the principal. Um, first is a transparency, uh, making sure that we all have the same information, making sure that there's access uh, across the school. Uh, and the second is uh, high expectations. Uh, and that includes setting high expectations for students, uh, for their achievement, uh, and also instructional leadership, creating that systemic change that moves us forward together uh, as a school. And the third thing that I heard a little bit, uh, and I want to bring it into the conversation now, is, is that element of, of fun. Uh, that, that high school, it, it can be really hard and it can be really challenging. 
Um, but gosh, when, when it's done right, it, it can also be really fun uh, for the students, for the teachers, for the staff, maybe even for the principal. Thank you. Lauren, if you earn this position, how will you measure your success in five years? What will it mean to graduate from BHS? So I think one thing, or I guess a way to measure, you know, the, the success of the school um, would be is as student is that as students are are in trying are, are in BHS and as they go to, as they go to graduate that they as they reflect back on their experience that they know that they've had high quality that they've had an, that they have had access to a high quality meaningful education that has provided them with the skills and the knowledge and the experience. Um, that no matter what their path is in the world, that they feel prepared to be able to enter into the world um, uh, ready to take on its challenges, think flexibly, think flexibly, dream big, and be able to take on any, any sort of challenge and know that they have the confidence to be able to do so. Um, I think that the, my success is really, is it, it, as I think Stephen pointed out, it's really not about my success, but the success of our students and having them feel feel able and ready to be active members within the community um, and that their voice matters and that they have the skills to be able to take on any challenge, whether that's whether they're college bound, um, whether they're entering right into a workforce um, or, or working on within different trades um, or within any realm of the community. Um, I, I, I do believe that um, another way that would show showcase success is also to build this community up um, and to have BHS be um, the, the high school that it, that it deserves to be, a leader in education in the state of Vermont, in New England, um, and having our, our name really um, stand out to others and have students embracing our culture um, and, our, and each other within this community. And so what does that look like? It looks like students, um, it looks like eighth graders that are getting ready to transition into high school, um, being eager and, you know, and, and nervous, but excited to, to walk through those doors and engage in their education and know that for the next four years, like that they matter and that their growth is being acknowledged and that their, their interests are being seen and cultivated. Um, it means that our students are being seen as leaders within the, not only within the classroom and in the community, but within our, within our BHS community, but also within our, our, our Burlington community, um, that they're helping each other, that we're growing together and really being able to cultivate ourselves that as they go out, um, they, they know that they can take on any challenge and that they also are leaving with the camaraderie um, of what their school has provided them and knowing that there's always an open door for them to go back to um, and know that people there will welcome them back in, embrace them and say like, we're so proud of you for what you've accomplished. Um, so I think that the the success, you know, I, I think it's hard to say like, what's my success? I feel like as, as, and I don't want to graduate, I'd like to invest in BHS and stay here beyond five years. <laughs> Um, but it's really being able to, to see just the success of our students and seeing them take on any challenge within our, our Vermont community and, and really the world community. Thank you. Um, wow. So Grace, that was great. Thank you for the last question. That brings, that sort of concludes our forum. And I just want to say that on behalf of Grace, Paul, and the hiring committee, that we thank Lauren, Greg, and Stephen for joining us tonight. And I'm glad I'm not the person making the decision, which will be great. And I wanna thank the community, the students, the parents, community members, faculty and staff who were attending. And I really want to encourage you, We. It's so important that we hear from you. You're here, we wanna hear what you think. So please take some time, um, if you have it, to complete the Google form. Again, it's in the chat and it's also available. If you don't wanna do it tonight, it's also available um, on our website, the BHS website under the BHS principal search. So let us let us hear from you and um, make sure that you do that. And with that, I would say good night. 
And I believe that our timing, as with everything, is perfect. perfect. Thank you, candidates. You did a wonderful job. Lots of great information. And we'll see you when we see you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good night.